Hello everyone, welcome to your 2012-2013 recertification pre-course process. My name is Dwayne Cattell, I'm one of the regional paramedic educators with the base hospital program. Today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about interosseous access. We're going to do a quick review of the directive itself. So what are our objectives today? Uh, when we're done this, we're completed this process, uh, the paramedic should be able to list the indications, the contraindications, and the conditions for establishing an interosseous needle. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, fluid and medication infusion through the interosseous line, as well as we're going to actually demonstrate in a video the correct application in establishing an interosseous needle based on the type of needles that services carry in our region. So IO access, intraosseous access, um, it's a good alternative when intravenous access is not obtainable. Uh, regarding intraosseous access, it does have some significant challenges. Uh, one of them is, is that it's not utilized very often, so it's a skill that needs uh, constant training to become proficient at it and feel comfortable with it when we're on scene. Some of the other challenges, uh, if the needle is not inserted properly, it, it, the fluid and or medication become, can go interstitial into the surrounding tissue. Uh, based on the substance that you're infusing, it uh, could actually cause tissue necrosis, uh, permanent uh, tissue damage. Um, one of the other things is that interosseous access requires a pressure infusion bag. Uh, it is a high pressure type of infusion in that you're, it's not going into a vein and a bone is essentially a non-collapsible vein and we have to push this fluid in and we need to make sure that we are in the mudulary sinus where there's blood flow as opposed to the Haversian canal so that way um, the medication fluid gets administered properly and absorbed into the patient. Uh, bone marrow can cause problems as far as clotting goes with the interosseous needle. Uh, with the interosseous access as well, uh, you need to continuously monitor the IO site for signs of infiltration, uh, interstitial fluid uh, into the tissues, as well as uh, fluid overload. We still have to monitor this like we would in intravenous patients. Still can go into fluid overload with interosseous access. Um, there also can be there can also be trauma as a result um, by actually uh, fracturing the uh, the tibia. Uh, this mostly happens in pediatric or pediatric patients. Set. So, what are our indications for use uh, for an IO needle? The actual and or potential need for fluid and or medication administration where an IV is unobtainable uh, for whatever reason, fractures, uh, amputations, whatnot, and the patient has to be in a cardiac arrest state or near cardiac arrest state. So what are our contraindications for use? Uh, intraosseous access is contraindicated when there is a fracture proximal to the access site as well as a suspected or known prosthetic knee or limb proximal to the access site as well. So what is our required equipment? In our region, different services carry different interosseous uh, kits or interosseous tools. Uh, there is the jam sheety needle, interosseous needle. Uh, some actually carry the cook needle as well as the bone injection gun and then there are other services that actually carry the easy IO drills. So we're also going to need a preloaded syringe about 10 to 20 mLs of normal saline, half filled with normal saline. We're going to need our IV solution itself, our drip sets, a uh, pressure infusion bag of some type. Uh, some services may just utilize a blood pressure cuff. Uh, alcohol swabs, uh, tapes, uh, and 4x4 four four dressings. So when we're assessing for difficulties in uh, establishing an IO needle, uh, some of the difficulties that we do encounter are just unable to find that uh, tibial tuberosity and go two finger breaths below on the medial aspect of the tibia itself. Um, people with uh, prosthetic limbs pose a problem. Obviously you can't infuse 
fluid. It's not going to go into a prosthetic limb. Um, there are, and the last one are finally our corpulent patients. So you need a longer interosseous needle that needs to go through that epidermal tissue into the dermal tissue, through the subcutaneous fat, and into the uh, tibial itself. So now I'm going to show you a video and if it's uh, with Dr. Don Eby, a regional paramedic educator, Pete Morissuti, and myself and showing you the three different uh, systems that are in our region and we're going to show you how to properly insert an IO needle. Thank you. Hi, I'm Don Eby, the local medical director for uh, Grey Bruce Huron in Perth counties and uh, with me today are Dwayne Patel, regional paramedic educator. And Pete Morris, City Regional Paramedic Educator. And what we're going to do is demonstrate um, inter interosseous uh, access. Now, there's nothing, um, well, there's almost nothing that is as upsetting as when you're in a situation where you need to have intravenous access and you can't get it. Uh, interosseous access is the fallback position. So, in the region, there are actually three different. Um, ways of doing this, or at least three different pieces of equipment. There's the Jamshi needle, um, the easy I.O. Uh, drill, and the big um, gun. So we're going to demonstrate all three of these. Um, maybe we'll start with Dwayne um, showing how to use the uh, Jamshi needle first. So you've established that uh, the child's in a cardiac arrest or a pre-arrest state and IV access is unobtainable. <clears throat> so donning your personal protective equipment and making sure all your equipment is ready um, and we have everything set in place here. Now, um, picking the site, um, you want to find the tibial tuberosity and go uh, one to two finger brettus below that uh, and finding the medial aspect of the tibia on the, uh, on the medial side. Swabbing the site to make sure it's clean, aseptic of course, as necessary. From here, you can actually place padding underneath the, uh, the infant or the child's legs. It's, it's a safety precaution for us. The jam sheeting needle itself, there's flanges in place, make sure it's uh, all screwed into place. Uh, two different sizes, a uh, 16 gauge and an 18 gauge. 18 gauge is for less than one year of age, and a 16 gauge is for greater than one year of age. After you find the tibial tuberosity, uh, two finger breasts below the medial aspect of this is tibial tuberosity is here. So we are about right here. With the jam sheety, it's a twisting and pushing uh, type of motion, 80% twist, 20% push, till it pops in. Once it pops in, bring the flange down into place that will secure it. Release the top flange pull out the trocar. From this point, uh, 10 cc syringe filled half full of saline. You will screw that into place. Aspirate back for marrow. It should be straw colored. And once you have that, grasp the back of the uh, lower leg itself and just gently flush it, making sure there is no infiltration noted. From this point, um, you will take your IV bag, which is in your pressure infuser up your IV line and then you would pump it up to approximately 300 millimeters of mercury tor in order to get flow within the bag. So Dwayne, how would you how would you be sure that you're in the bone marrow? Be sure we're in the bone marrow is that when you aspirate back you will have bone marrow and clots coming back into the syringe. It should be straw colored and the clots obviously red. You should not feel uh, tissue filling up with fluid at the back of the calf. Um, and uh, basically you would have good flow. That way you're sure you're in a mujillary sinus as opposed to a Haversian canal. So, and then run your line as necessary and treat your patient with the jam sheet. And if your needle is starting to waver around. Yes. Um, you can block it up, you can put clean, you can put tape to secure it into place and that way you've ensured you're in the proper spot and it's not going to become dislodged. Okay, so that's the basic procedure. Um, we're now going to demonstrate the... Um, which one do we want to move 
first? Do you want to do the We'll the, do the big, the big first. Button? Sure. All right. Uh, there's two types of bigs that are present. The pediatric big, which is red and maintains a red barrel, which you can adjust the size to the eight. This one is uh, set for age. There are some out there that have uh, weight associated with them. And then the adult big, which is a blue barrel, and does not adjust it as a one standard depth. Um, you're going to want to grab the big by the blue barrel and hold it with your non-dominant hand, as here. And if you look at the bottom, you see that the center is offset, hence under the red arrow. It's the same positioning, same location as we did with the jam sheety. You find the typical tuberosity, you're going to go over about two centimeters, and then one centimeter down for the pediatric. And if it's an adult, two centimeters medially and one centimeter up. Place the barrel against the skid. Please remember, once we pull the red firing pin, the big is live, like so. Do not discard this red firing pin. It will help us secure um, the trocar and the needle in place. When we're ready, holding, we're going to place firm grip with two fingers from our dominant hand and thumb on top. And we're going to gently depress, hence releasing the needle, taking the big, wiggling it off, do not pull too hard as you'll dislodge the needle. Comes right off, hence leaving the trocar and the needle in place, taking the red firing pin and using it to secure the needle. We'll then, with a twisting motion, remove the trocar and out. Same technique, we'll take five uh, cc's of fluid, a 10 cc syringe, attach it, pull back to get the marrow, and then with the same technique, we're going to push the fluid in to ensure that it's in the proper location. And then we will attach our line with anywhere up to 300 uh, millimeters of pressure behind it. Go ahead and we'll watch the line run. Okay. And then we'll secure this red firing with two pieces of tape, one on each side. And that is the big. So it's a nice, simple technique that can be done pretty quickly. The problem with this is that it's potentially dangerous. If you're, uh, once you pull the firing pin, as Dwayne said, or sorry, as, as Pete said, um, it's live and uh, this will shoot some distance. So lastly, um, we'll get Dwayne back to do the easy I.O., uh, which is again a, a different, a different uh, sort of technique or mechanism for putting it in. This can be done very quickly, um, as maybe we'll get Dwayne to illustrate. So same procedure, you establish they need the interosseous line, uh, measure down below the tibial tuberosity, about two finger breadths the medial side of the tibia, swab the site clean, make sure it's aseptic. All your equipment is prepared. <clears throat> With the easy I.O. drill, um, pick the needle length you want. There are different uh, sizes, there are different lengths, there's different gauges. For pediatric, we'll probably use a, a 15 to 18 gauge. It's magnetic, it grabs on, the cover comes off. From here, you know where you're going. You put the drill bit, or the needle, up against the patient's leg and gently just drill and not pushing, the needle will pull itself in. So, once it is in, disconnect the drill, take the needle out, dump your sharp. From here, what you will do, it comes with a line. Here, you will, it's primed already. You will aspirate back for blood and clots and marrow and then flush the line to ensure patency. Once it is flushed, then you will hook up your IV tubing as with the other IO devices. Uh, pump it up to 300 millimeters of mercury torque pressure in the infusion bag. And There's three um, different access methods that we've used. Um, the jam sheeting needle, the um, big gun and the easy I.O. Um, you just have to practice whichever uh, 
mechanism of obtaining IO access that uh, you have the equipment for.